So, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me. It's a pleasure. I, I have a lot of questions I want to ask you, but uh, I wanted to start with something quite recent, which is the fact that you wrote a piece recently for uh, Simon Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic. And I'd like to hear a little bit about that experience, what it was like, first of all, working with them, and what sort of piece you wrote for them. I was working on two pieces at once, practically. When this when when this commission came, I was a bit scared because I didn't didn't think I could make it uh, that that year. And so I decided to do something I knew how to do, and uh, I had thought about it, that kind of problem in another piece before that, which was what makes a piece in in, in several movements, especially song cycles, for instance hold together. How, how does it hang together? I have no answer to, to that question. Uh, it, it's very mysterious. And my, my model actually was the uh, pictures at the exhibition of Mussorgsky. Mm. I've been very fascinated by this piece for a long time. I'm fascinated by Mussorgsky anyway. But th this piece was to me a kind of model I would like to to experience with. And, and I had started doing this with uh, my viola concerto, which is called uh, Frauen Lieben, in which between each of the leaders uh, there's a promenade. Uh, the uh, viola, so to speak, goes from one leader to another, and the music uh, is aimless. That was, that was another problem. In, in the Mussorgsky, the music is not aimless because there's a theme that comes back. But in that, uh, that piece, this, this was a new problem. I wanted to write music that was not oriented, uh, that didn't seem to go anywhere. And, and I, I, I remember Stockhausen saying about uh, Klavierstück 11 that the point of that piece is that it is not oriented. When you come to the end of each sequence, you don't know where you're going. That was a fascinating idea, which I tried to explore. In my piece, what I do is actually quite simple. I, I work with, with only a melodic line. But however, I have no solution to give young composers if they want to do this. How do you disorient a melody? I guess you have to, first of all, uh, abolish any sense of... of tonal center. Mm. Even if you're writing uh, atonal music, there's always an uh, attraction somewhere. And, and so I try to do that. And the, the point is not to reproduce the same intervals at different octaves. That's another, that's one thing I discovered. And I had succeeded in doing this in, in Frauenleben. And so I decided that that's something I know how to do, so I'll do it again, you know, uh, differently, of course and decided that it was going to be a suite because it, I thought it would be easier to write a suite than, than a, you know, one full, full piece uh, with, no, with no sections. But that wasn't, that wasn't as easy as I thought. Uh, so, anyway, I, I wrote this piece quite fast because I had to. I'm not a I'm not a fast worker. No, normally I'm I'm very slow worker. In fact, I, I I work practically from measure to measure. Nothing is given ahead of time. I have no 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 system that I can work by. I don't know what my system is. So the the form of the piece it emerges organically as you're working. It doesn't. You don't have a plan um, as to. Well, uh, I did have a plan as to what I wanted to do. And again, the 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 leader. Uh, tradition was very influential in, in my plan. In other words, I, I wanted to characterize each, each of the movements which, which were not the movements I called strolling, which were disoriented, which were the promenades, in other, in other words. So I decided each one needed to be very characterized as far as timbre is concerned. And thinking of the Berlin Philharmonic, of course, I decided I would center each piece on a certain group of instruments. And so one of the pieces is more or less centered on uh, uh, percussion, uh, another one is on, on the winds. And, and thinking of the soloists in, in that orchestra, of course, was very important. Uh, I decided I would give them something to play. And they were very glad 
they, they came to tell me that, which, which never happens in this country, but I, I couldn't believe it. They were all very happy to have real melodic lines to, to play. And uh, the way they told me this was so incredible, I, I couldn't believe it. So that, from that standpoint, I felt, I felt good. I felt good. In fact, it was a great surprise. One of the pieces I, I remember, I was thinking of the oboist and, uh, and oh, the English right. horn, yes. Yeah. Uh, I knew, I uh, had heard him in, in, some, in some recordings and I said, oh my, I must write something for him. But when I heard my piece played, I, it, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard. Mm-hmm. Not the piece, but the, the sound of the oboe and, and the sound of the, of the English horn. Uh, I had written a, a, a duet for for oboe and English horn, like like <laughs> the symphonie fantastique. Uh, one always has parents, don't I? <laughs> and so uh, I, w- I said to myself, "Oh my God, I, I wrote I wrote the English horn too low to play pianissimo, but it came out pianissimo. It was absolutely wonderful." Everything about this performance was a, was a, a wonderful surprise, and not a, not only the performance but the reaction of the orchestra, the way they they, they greeted this, this music uh, coming from somebody they didn't know at all uh, was extremely moving for me. Extremely moving. And what about Sir Simon Rattle? What was what was yeah. that like working yes. with him? Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, and Sir Simon Rattle, of course, was very much uh, very important in getting this piece played because, after, after all, it was his idea, uh, and I was so touched. I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, this was the the surprise of my of my late life <laughs> to to get a commission from the Berlin Philharmonic, uh, and and uh, I had never been played that way. I would have panicked at the idea of writing for them if I had had more time. I'm glad I didn't have more time. Mm-hmm. Well, there's one, one thing I wanted to ask you about in what you just said, which is that you, you start with the melodic idea. And you mentioned that also that the, the, the woodwind players of the Berlin Philharmonic were, de- were delighted to have um, melodic, real melodic parts to play. Mm-hmm. But that's something of an unusual position in contemporary music, where often the, the sort of stereotype of, of contemporary music is that it, it doesn't have a melodic aspect, and that a lot of composers have sort of neglected that. I know, I know, uh, and, and uh, they were surprised about that. Uh, they, 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 in fact, they were surprised that to be able to be heard because in so much contemporary music, the whole orchestra is, is used all the time, and the, and the texture is thick, mm-hmm. and and the, the, no, nothing nothing stands out. Uh, that's the feeling I have often in listening to some contemporary music. I guess that there's a this fear of, of writing a melodic line these days, and this is something I cannot help doing. Uh, I guess it has to do with the way I was trained. In my early life as a composer, I was a member of the chorus, and I, I discovered uh, Renaissance music, and I always feel today still that this music sort of guides my hand uh, in in the way I write. Uh, I, it says like Lassus is behind me and and you know holding holding my my, my pencil. Huh? There are really melodic lines that I that I find very close to the, the, the ones I sang in the, way back, 60 years ago. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned once in an interview that when you, when you returned to France, when was it, 50? What, what year did you come back to France after being in, in New York? 1946. 46, and you said that you were really interested in, in, in pre-Baroque music at the time. Yes. yes. But nobody in France was aware of that at all. No, no. So that, there's, there are now classes in, in 16th century counterpoint. No, like there that. was that. But at the time... <laughs> No, this was a, a shock to a point. I mean, when I when I discovered that I that I really had to enter the conservatory, which was not what I thought I was going to be doing. You know, I thought I thought I was going to be a composer, uh, and that's it. You know, because I had just graduated from Bellingham with a BA, and I, I thought this was the beginning of my career. I, I had written a mass, and, and everybody sang it on campus. I thought I was a great composer. Didn't work. So I had to start all over again. I'm glad I did, you know, when I think of it. I, I'm glad I did, but uh, it was hard. 
well, it was it was hard not only because I had never worked that way, but because the conservatory at the time was was a rather sad, uh, closed up place, uh, and uh, there, there were all kinds of of, of things you c you couldn't do, and 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 you, things you didn't talk about, and and things that uh, people didn't even know about, uh, and and I remember just speaking about shoots, said, oh, shoots is so boring. I had just sung the, the, the multi-chorus pieces uh, in New York, and I thought this was crazy. I mean, there was something wrong with that. And of course, the conservatory. This was a, this was just after the war, and, and the conservatory was still a, in 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 a pretty bad condition. I mean, materially speaking, and and so I I was a little shocked about that. Uh, to me, music was something something which made me so happy. The idea of, of being sad to have to study music was some, something I couldn't understand at first. Well, I got over that after a while. It took me a while to enter the composition class. I started with uh, fugue and counterpoint, did a lot of fugue and did a lot of counterpoint. I loved, I loved doing counterpoint. I mean, I've been writing double choruses and things like that. I, the more the voices, the more voices, the, more, the better. You know, I, li I like that. But uh, I finally entered the composition class, and that was Darius Miu. Mm -hmm. At that time, the analysis class was compulsory. And so it was a strange feeling of having two teachers at the same time, because uh, Messiaen, of course, was Messiaen, and, and uh, Miu was Messi Miu. I don't think they liked each other very much. I remember feeling I didn't want to talk about Messiaen's class to Miu, you know. Uh, he just said, uh, you have to go there, it, it, it's compulsory, go. But he didn't think it was, you know, that interesting, yeah. Uh, I think, in spite of the fact that I was a bit disappointed because he, he had been ordered by the director of, of the time to work on Beethoven's symphonies. And I thought I knew all about Beethoven symphonies. You know, in New York, I had I had t attended all of Toscanini's uh, rehearsals. I didn't think I, need, I needed to learn anything more. But however, when uh, Michel started working on those symphonies, and at that time, you know, we didn't have recordings; it was all on the piano. And getting a score, it was, it was very difficult. It was very soon after the war, and the scores were expensive and hard to hard to get, and so there were there were not enough scores for all the students of Bessel's and the students were very numerous, because a lot of them were not students, were just auditors, mm -hmm. auditing the class. Anyway, it was a, an incredible class, which I wish I will never forget, and I, I don't think anybody who attended that class will ever forget it. I remember discovering the Third Symphony, the Eroica, which I didn't like. I didn't understand it. I really didn't like it. I didn't want to listen to it. So you discovered it through a piano reduction then? Uh, first. To him, playing. Yeah. Playing on the piano. Wow. Yeah. Mm. But I had a score. I, I, I still have my score with, with my notation. And years later, when I became myself an analysis teacher at the conservatory, I remember having hesitated for a long time to be to to cope with that symphony again, you know, and I looked over my notes and I suddenly discovered I, dis I disagreed, and so I told the Messiaen that I didn't I disagreed, uh, and he he said, oh how interesting, <laughs> you must tell me we must discuss this one day. <laughs> We never did, <laughs> but however, I did, I did teach it myself after a while. Yeah, in, through those Beethoven symphonies that I thought I knew, uh, he did open up a lot of paths, and he was extremely interested in in the music that was being written at the time, and he got us interesting as as well, and as as the years went by. He attended all the concerts where new music was being played of the young people, even those who did, who were not known at all. He was always at the Domaine Musical of Boulez, and, and uh, uh, Boulez had been his students, of course, uh, before me. So that, those were the years. So that that's the thing I wanted to ask you about as well, because you you're, you're part of a generation that lived through one of the most profound transformations in in music, 
really. I mean, it's hard to think of another period of music history in which so many things happened so quickly, in which the language evolved so quickly. And there was this rapid expansion in terms of what could be done and, and the sort of uh, explorations that composers were, were leading at the time. So how did you view all of that at the time? Was it, was it exciting? Was it, uh, was it disturbing? Was it, um, it, it's, very, it's very hard to imagine uh, from the point of view of, of, uh, of someone who's starting out now what that must have been like. It, it was both disturbing and exciting. Uh, and, and it was very much connected to the general situation of the time, which was the Cold War. You had to take sides. It, it was very clear. You had to, you had to decide uh, what kind of music you were going to write. The music that I was interested in, uh, at first I, 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 was, I was reluctant, I must confess. I was reluctant, but in me, your class, uh, there were uh, all the what they co what we say we call it freshly les jeunes loups the the, the young wolves uh, <laughs> who uh, who started to be known uh, in 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 the field of very modern music avant garde and they pushed me really my problem was that i was older than they were i was 10 years older than everybody else in the class because this was my second series of, of studies right because you studied uh, in new york during the that's war. right yeah. and so i had already a few ideas about what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do also. So there were things I was interested in and there were things I was not interested in. But I wanted to, I wanted to find out what was being done. And so very soon, you know, I, I, I began attending those concerts. Uh, I'm talking about the domaine musical. Mm -hmm. So I, I, saw, I saw the greats arrive little by little, I mean, uh, Stockhausen, uh, Boulez, uh, uh, Berio, and I saw things moving out of the, what I call the purgatory at first, which was, I didn't particularly like. I was absolutely sure I didn't want to write pointillistic music. That I was sure. I listened carefully and I said, what's, there's something wrong with that. I can't, I can't go for that. Well, for one thing, when you, in the, the sort of pointillist style, so things like uh, Contrapunkte of Stockhausen or, um, or maybe some of the, the early piano sonatas of, of Boulez, it, it's, there's kind of a denial of melody because the, the notes aren't really related to each other in a continuum. They're just individual points in a, in a, in a space. So presumably because you're, the melodic aspect has always been very important to you, that wasn't really compatible. Well, I went in for that for, for a while, uh, a little bit, a little bit. Not really, very frankly. I must confess, I did try to write music that sounded like theirs at, at one point, because I thought that was the thing to do in order to be a composer, you know? But, you know, this is a time when, when, when uh, the, the people who didn't write that kind of music, who, who hated it, called it that music. And uh, you were known to write that music. And so I, uh, I, I was very conscious of that. And, and there, there was, a, there was a, a, a fracture between those who wrote that music and those who didn't write that music. Yeah. And those who didn't write that music seemed to me to sort of refuse to go ahead. I mean, they, 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 they kept coming back on something that had already, had, had already been done and, and, and uh, that sounded like pre-war music. Yeah. And I wasn't very, I wasn't very interested in that. And I remember, I, I liked Darius Mio very much, but I, I remember he was, he was a little hesitant to see me move in that direction. He said, you know, when I came, when I came back to him after one of those concerts where I had discovered Vibron, I never heard it, anything like that. And, and it, it was not one of the 12 tone pieces. Uh, it was Opus 10, I think. Mm -hmm. To me, it was something I had never heard before. You know, it, it, it was quite magic. And I told him about it, and, I, and, and he said, oh, watch out, you'll get caught. And he said that sadly, you know. I you know, said, why, why, why would he say that? I, I mean, he is come, he, after all, he was interested in, in uh, avant-garde music in his time. Uh, he conducted Pierre Lunaire in Paris for the first time. Uh, now he is not, 
he's, he's, he's not going in for that. So anyway, I, I, I went ahead and uh, pretty soon I realized that my, my goal would be to be played there for, for another reason because I had a few pieces that had been played at the radio and uh, I had had trouble with uh, the performance. Just, just, just play the notes. My music was not particularly difficult, but I wasn't getting the notes. Conductor conducted one of my pieces and got lost. Can't forget that. So, uh, I had to forbid the piece to be broadcast. So these were the years again, and <laughs> so I decided the only way, the only place I wanted to, to to be played, where I wanted to be played, was the Domaine Musical. And pretty soon I, I went there and very regularly. I, I attended the concerts and the rehearsals as well, and followed the, the whole evolution very closely. Got hold of the scores when I could. Uh, traveled to Donaueschingen, traveled to Darmstadt to see what was going on. And I remember deciding that I was not going to take everything. Uh, I was just going to take what I needed. No more. So maybe you could just say a word about what the Domaine Musicale was, because that, that was a very important feature of musical life in Paris at the time. Indeed, yes. The Domaine Musicale was a, a series of concerts that was started by Pierre Boulez, in 1954, I guess, uh, you have to check on that. They were, they were totally private, they were funded by Mecenas, uh, and uh, Boulez had uh, also the support of Jean-Louis Barrault and Madeleine Renaud. Uh, he had been their musical director for their theatre. And the first concerts the programs were, were very, very ambitious, very, very long, not at all conceived uh, along the rules of uh, the usual concerts. I mean, they, and, and at, at first, uh, Boulez was mixing uh, music uh, of several periods. Then he gave that up because it, it, he told me it, 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 it created a problem about performers because performers began to be specialized in shall we say baroque music or or, or uh, early music and, and so it was hard to to reconcile all this in, in one program and furthermore he said uh, very rightly that the uh, the music that was being written today really needed to be played and he soon gathered around him uh, the very best musicians of Paris. There was an orchestre du domaine musical which became very well known and, and, uh, and the concerts were recorded by a label called Vega right from the beginning. So there is uh, an archive uh, which is uh, extremely interesting. Well, it's also interesting because a lot of these pieces, of course, are, are, are become classic today. But uh, th at that time they were played uh, very differently and, 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 and it was rather scary to play them. I, I can never forget the, the first performances of, of uh, Webern's uh, uh, Symphony Opus 21. I mean, uh, the, the, the beginning with the, with the two hordes uh, dipping down uh, from a cliff, uh, so to speak. <laughs> It's something, I, every time I hear this symphony, I, I remember this, uh, these early performances. Uh, and and uh, performances have improved incredibly since. To today, this music is played like normal music, shall we say. Uh, also, what, what uh, happened at that time, before those concerts were, uh, were released, Robert Kraft recorded all of Webern's music in, in the most dry uh, way, and, uh, sort of black and white, it became sort of the rule to consider that this, that's the way that music should sound. And when finally 
uh, over the years uh, there came a uh, retrospective of Weber's music, the first one and the second one. Second one was a revelation. I mean, suddenly this music became first became Viennese, first of all. It, it, it had rubato, it, it had beautiful sound. And, and uh, uh, I remember uh, commenting uh, to Boulez himself, not concerning Weber, but, but concerning his own music, uh, his own performance of his own music uh, that I had heard before. It was Pli selon Pli. Uh, no, it was uh, Improvisation sur, sur Valarmé. And I said, it's so wonderful to hear this music today. Uh, it sounds so, so great. I mean, all the resonance is there. And then he says, and I conduct so much better, he said. <laughs> so he was conscious of it too. Uh, and, and so things did move. Uh, and and, and pr gradually they moved out of this very dry, uh, sort of uh, very speculative uh, period which, which scared me a bit. I mean, it, to me, the, the idea that this, this was, was going to be the music of the future, uh, I, could, I couldn't accept that. I, I, had, I had trouble accepting that. Uh, I, I wasn't sure or, at that time. I, w I was young and I wasn't sure that, that, uh, that I was going to be able to make it. You know, I, I, I had great doubts about that. All I knew is that I didn't want to write the music that was being write, written elsewhere. Yeah. But you were saying that um, at, at the time there was a kind of there was a kind of separation between, I guess, pre-war music on the one hand, the sorts of the, the sorts of music that were being written um, up before before the Second World War, and then what, what was happening with the the, the, the jeune loup, the, the young wolves afterwards, people like Stockhausen, Boulez, Berriot. Uh, Madonna and, uh, and all these people, and so there was a kind of idea that you had to be in one or the other camp. You, you couldn't you couldn't have a, a historical consciousness on the one hand and, and be interested in. Um, well, pretty soon, pretty soon. I, I, I in fact I wrote an article about that uh, when there was, there was quite an assessment of what what uh, the, the the twelve tone movement had, had represented, where it stood today, you know. Uh, this was in the 70s, I guess, uh, when, when the Preuve uh, articles came out, yes. Uh, Boulez had always said something which I, I, I didn't agree with, uh, that, that uh, you had to forget the past. I couldn't forget the past, I didn't want to. And the past was it was part of my uh, of my uh, inheritance, and and it and it fed me. It fed my music, and and I did I didn't want to forget it. I never did. That's one thing. Uh, and and uh, the problem with with very many young composers of the time, uh, younger than 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 Boulez, I mean the the, the ones that were starting then, uh, they. Th they didn't know about that past, and and they they thought they were the first, first page of history was you know the, it was them, huh? And and they had to catch up after that. But not all of them did. Some of them never did, and so they disappeared. <laughs> but uh, it was a real problem, uh, and that that was one of the problems, uh, and and one one of the points. Uh, that I've always made, I mean, the fact that I, that I was older sort of uh, prevented me from falling to that pitfall, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, so I was able to keep afloat and keep my ears open on the past uh, in spite of it all. And, but it, it was kind of tyrannical at the time. There, there was, there was uh, the, 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 the spirit was very close to the political situation of the time, the Cold War. I mean, uh, there was the right and the left in music as well as, as, in, uh, as in the world. Yeah? Right, no, that's very interesting. So it sort of implies that there was a kind of ideology attached to that music. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Boulez was a, a bit responsible for that because, because uh, the, the, uh, his writings of the time are, are, are very, uh, are very violent. Uh, I mean, he just eliminates anybody who doesn't write the kind of music that he, that he is uh, advocating. Uh, it's just eliminating. No, no, it's useless. His word is useless. 
which is terribly hard. So I, for a while I didn't know where I stood, you know. Uh, it, it was very complicated to, to situate myself. I mean, I, I don't want to forget the past, and yet I'm interested in that music. Uh, where do I stand? You know, it, it was hard to find out. And for, for quite a while I didn't, I didn't dare show my music uh, to Boulez, first of all. He was famous. I was still at the conservatory, practically, although we were the same generation, because I was a late bloomer, you know. <laughs> so, finally I did show it to him, and he was very, very nice, very, very, uh, very serious about it. I mean, he, he took me seriously. That was another problem, of course, being a woman. You know? I had to bring up this problem, but it's, it's kind of the problem of the day, isn't it? It did. Uh, have an importance at the time, and and uh, people make made me feel it. Uh, in fact, when I did finally come out at the Domaine's Musicale with my quartet, there was a lot of stupid articles came out in in the papers, uh, pointing out the fact that you know uh, I, I was able to sew music, you know, hmm? that kind of thing. So I did have to fight against that. And one of, one of my fights concerned my, my date of birth, curiously. Uh, on, on, the pro, on the first programs where I was played, uh, everybody had their dates, so except me. And I said, no, I, I'm, I'm not an actress, uh, I'm not a singer, I'm a, I'm a composer. I said, I'm a composer. I mean, it's, uh, it's the first time I had said oh, I'm a composer. I want my date to be on the program. And ever since then, it has been on the program. Yeah. But you managed to impose yourself in a, in a uh, community where there weren't a lot of female composers at the time. It was very, it was very unusual. And, and in addition to that, you, had th you were raising three children at the outset of your career. So, uh, <laughs> so it, it, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So how did, you, how did you manage under those conditions to, well, to compose anything at all? I mean, it's... Uh, it it was a uh, an urge. Uh, it, it, there, there was no there was, there was no way I could not do it, you know, and and it did create problems. I I, I had problems. I mean, uh, composing, as you know, uh, takes time, uh, takes concentration, and this is what women don't get. That's one of their problems, you know. Uh, as Virginia Woolf said, you know. Uh, the problem with the woman is that she doesn't have a room of one's own, and I had a I had great trouble getting a room of my own. In, even in my family, it could, it couldn't be more understanding than, than my family. I, I was in the, in the most congenial environment. I mean, I always say that if I had wanted to be a banker or anything like that, uh, I don't think my parents would have liked it. They never said so. But that's the way I felt. But but I I, th I thought I would be you know a dancer, a singer, or a, a painter, or a writer. I didn't think I could be a composer as a little girl. But I, I did think of all, all this uh, this bouquet of, of very related activities. Then when when finally I decided there was this urge that I could fight against, you know, then I had to find time to do it. And often the time was taken on, on, on my, my sleep, you know. <laughs> I used to get up very, very early before the children went to school. But I also wanted to have children because I felt I wanted to be complete, you know. Uh, a composer and a wife and a, and a mother. I mean, this was pretty crazy at the time, yeah. Fortunately, I, I was helped. I, I mean, I couldn't have done that if I hadn't had any help. But still, I had to do a lot on my own, and uh, I could feel whenever whenever I left the family to to go to compose, uh, I I felt uh, guilty. And uh, the family, very nice family, did make me feel guilty. I mean, they they missed me, shall we say? Yeah. And however, the health made me feel very guilty because who what is this woman who goes away and leaves her children you know 
I felt that very strongly. So all of this I had to fight against, and I, I probably wouldn't have fought successfully if I hadn't felt that urge. I can define that urge, but it, it was so clear that I had to do it. That was my incentive at the time. It was, it was hard. It was hard, even with the help. Well, now, nowadays there, there are lots of successful female composers who are leading remarkable careers. So it, it seems as though things have improved somewhat since then. They have. But have they improved enough, in your, in your view? You know, this is a general situation. I mean, since we talk about that, uh, this has to do with the general situation of women today. People at large are finally admitting that women I mean, men at large, shall we say, are finally admitting that women are not only a body, but they have a mind, too. And the, the women are proving it, you know, proving the movement by, by walking, as we say. They, that, that's, for me, is, is, is very important, too. I mean, women should prove it uh, now, and they are doing it. But think of all the, all the centuries that we, we have to fight against, shall we say, uh, to make this uh, clear. It'll take a while. It'll take a while. I mean, when you think that Fanny Mendelssohn, for instance, was forbidden to publish by her brother, her beloved brother, uh, and her father, and she composed nevertheless, yeah, and she was very gifted. Yeah. So, this, this was only a century ago, I mean two centuries ago, shall we say. Uh, but uh, So let's not be uh, in, in too much of a hurry. We have to, we have to give time for, to things to take their place. It moves differently in different countries, shall we say. I think it probably moves faster in America than it moves, or in Canada, than, than it moves in France. It, it, for instance, it's, it's pretty difficult. Huh? It's still a problem. It's still a problem. Women should understand that they need to participate in that movement. Not only should they prove that they are, that they do have a mind, and they're doing that very well, and, and sometimes very brilliantly, but they should also respect those who are doing it. I mean, there are, there are some women who think that women should not come forward, you know? And and they are they are they are putting a, 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 a what is the word I'm looking for a frein breaks a break okay <laughs> this is where I'm, I become French <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. and and was, uh, they, they they shouldn't do that women should help women move forward yeah another aspect of uh, shall we say, uh, women being uh, in their careers, is, is a jealousy between women towards men with whom they work. I mean, it, it, this is ridiculous. And this is typically feminine. Huh? So that should finish. That, that should stop. Nobody ever talks about that. Yeah. So, we, are still, we still have a little, little work to do. So at this point, I, I, I finally come to the, to, the, to the point at my age, uh, 91, that uh, uh, I am a composer now. <laughs> I finally have admitted this. It took me a while. It took me a while to decide that, well, why, why do I have this urge? I mean, do I, am I really a composer? Uh, and only, only a woman should, would ask that question, not a man. So, I finally answered that question, I think. I think there's no doubt. So, so what about the, si the situation of, of music today, uh, in, in particularly in France? Because we mentioned earlier that in, in, in 1950s particularly, and in the 1960s, there was a, there was a real uh, clivage, a kind of, uh, you had to take a position. It was very polemical, it was very, um, very much a question of taking sides. And how how do you view things today? Because it seems like it seems like there's you still have these sects or these factions of, of different yes. groups. So has it has that gotten any better over time, or is it is it still kind of the same situation? Uh, I guess it's it's continual to France. I think France likes that kind of situation. I don't take it very seriously, 
the French like to like to be able to explain things, and wh whenever whenever you, you you cannot be explained, I mean, you, you, whatever you do in life cannot be explained, which is by case uh, very often, they get worried, and um, ultimately they can throw you out because they can't explain. You know, that's the solution. Well, the situation is, is uh, moving fast. Actually, I'm t totally incapable of predicting where it's going. Uh, I just find some music totally uninteresting and, and uh, it's hard to define why it's uninteresting. I mean, it is, I find myself using the, the, the word Boulez used in the 50s. I mean, it, it seems useless. That's interesting. So do you, do you think that there are certain things that music should do generally, regardless of the style? Are there certain features and aspects that have to be present in order for us to have a satisfying musical experience? I think the criteria should be widened, and that's, that's one of the problems. People still hang on to old criteria, so tonal or atonal. That's a wrong problem. Uh, that's, that's not the problem. I mean, the, the, I, I can imagine tonal music being written today. Uh, and in fact, I, I've just had the experience uh, with, with a former assistant of mine who, is, who writes tonal music, and he just sent me a quartet, and this is the second time he sends me a quartet. The first time he was writing like bar talk, and I told him so because I'm, I'm usually quite candid about uh, what I think. And uh, this time he's much more at ease writing tonal music, uh, which is very well written, good quartet writing. And he told me I feel better. And and why not? Why not? Now, to, I, I cannot predict whether this, was, this will go down in history. I'm not sure it will. I mean, what, what goes down in history also? It's hard, it's hard to say. I was yesterday at the Musée Picasso. There was a wonderful show of Diego Giacometti. I was with my daughter and we went to see also the show about Guernica, all about Guernica. Oh, yes. Which is fantastic, amazing, amazing all the preliminary work, which was done very fast, uh, under the shock of the event. The sketches. Yeah. Yes. But the art, I mean, <laughs> the technic, uh, technical aspect of it uh, just, just shocked me. I mean, I was amazed, amazed. So, some uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, China ink, uh, big painting. Well, I wouldn't call it a painting. What would you call it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a painting. It's it's China ink, <laughs> and and the 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 whole space is filled with with uh, with crosses, uh, which gives light. Mm -hmm. So some of it is very is very tight, and the texture is very is practically black, and some of it is is much lighter, and and it's fantastic, absolutely amazing. Somebody watching that at the time, what would they say? This man knows how to knows how to draw and paint and uh, but uh, could they tell that it was going to go down in history the way it has you know so I, i'm not i'm not going to predict anything like that but and i don't have an i, I don't have I, I don't like prejudice uh, i'm not prejudiced i don't eliminate any music that you know doesn't doesn't fit my idea of, of what's interesting Okay, so I wanted to ask you about something else that you were mentioning, which is that the fact that you, don't, you didn't really particularly belong to a category. So from a technical perspective, your music is completely chromatic most of the time, right? I mean, it's, you, you use all the, all the semitones, you sometimes even use quarter tones, uh, but it's not serial music, and you don't write according to any of the sort of methodologies that were being used um, at the time and, and still today. I mean, you, you have a very personal musical language that that uh, it, you, can't, you can't really tell very easily how it's done. Neither can I. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's how a, you work, exactly? Uh, well, all right. One of, one of my concerns uh, uh, when I was writing the quartet at the very beginning, uh, I, I, I discovered quite a few things when I was writing that piece. It took me a while to write it. Uh, and, this is and, uh, Quatre Hors Deux. Quatre Hors Deux, yes, uh, with voice. Uh, and this was for the Domaine Musical, and I, I worked over a year on that piece, which is only 15 minutes long. 
I mean, I work slowly, but not that slowly, usually. So, one of the things I was bothered with at the time, with what I heard at the Domaine Musical, was fixed pitches. I, th I, 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 I felt very strongly that uh, harmonically it was boring. I mean, it, it didn't move and that we had lost something there. I wanted to cure this <laughs> somehow. And so I, I, I practically, uh, I had never really studied harmony I mean, except Bach chorales, you know, I, not, not in the French way. I had never studied harmony at the conservatory. So I had to find my own way and, and, and finally, I, I, I came back to, to actually the old rules. I mean, a contrary motion and the extremes and all, all that, uh, keeping an, uh, an atonal uh, general feeling. To me, uh, tonality was no longer the, the purpose uh, of, of my music, nor the guiding light, shall we say. So I was, I was looking for that too. I decided, for instance, that uh, doing away with themes was uh, a loss that we had not filled in, you know, there, there was something missing. And the idea that, uh, that uh, again, Boulez, I didn't agree with him, where he said something like, music is, is, has no memory, it should, ne should never go back on, on something that's being said, it should, be, it should always be going ahead, which I found r ridiculous. I, I I didn't dare say it at the time. You see, it, 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 this was the feeling at the time. But I, f I felt very strongly that there was something wrong with that. That, I mean, after all, we needed we needed to appeal to our memory somewhere in the unfolding of a piece. Furthermore, I, I, had, uh, I had never really looked into 12-tone music, so I didn't really understand it. I have to confess that today. <laughs> I had to learn about it later when I began to teach. But uh, I wasn't really very interested in counting, you know, from 1 to 12, so I, I pretended I couldn't count to, to 12, you know, which was uh, stupid, of course. But people th thought, I mean, as long, people, you know, kept uh, looking for 12 notes uh, in, in my music uh, and, and have, have continued over the years, uh, just because it's, it's not tonal. They ask me about my music, but what is your music like, you know? Well, I say it's atonal and it's beautiful. <laughs> <gasps> How can it be both atonal and beautiful? <laughs> well, I try to make it beautiful, I say, yeah. The uh, idea of, of beauty as a value in itself wasn't very... Well, beautiful. I have my, my own criteria for beauty, of course. One of my criteria is very simple. Uh, I, I, I will... Uh, disclose it, shall we say. Uh, it, it has to do with the relationship with my polyphony. It, it, it's generally in relationship with, with sixths and thirds, which which makes it uh, consonant, shall we say. Mm -hmm. uh, but not functional. No, no, and that works, and that works. But I am continually learning from from the past. I feel that very strongly today, now that I dare say it. And w w when I, I heard about uh, the, this discovery of Messiaen, you know, working with music from other composers and, and, and ch making them into his own, uh, I felt, well, uh, what's, f what's strange about that? We all do that, don't we? At least I do. But it, it, it's, not, it's not necessarily a whole measure that one can re recognize. It's just a way of going from one thing to another. It, it's a change of tempo, it's, it's a rhythm, it's, it's, it can be anything. And the fact that I, I learn a lot of music by heart, just, just to keep my, my old fingers going, is a, an incredible composition lesson for me at my age, all the time. I'm, it it continually gives me ideas as to what I want to do. I, I'm, I'm learning. I'm still learning. And I'm still trying things I've never done before. And uh, at this point, I am very interested in, in combining uh, d different, very typical music, combining uh, in time. What do you mean by that? Huh. It's very hard to define. I mean, imagine, I mean, you have to imagine something precise, like, like two marching bands uh, with different slogans, uh, m marching together. 
and and not not listening to each other. Yeah, I mean, of course, this is what Ives used to do, of course. But uh, I have a, a few slogans in mind also, which which I, I I've, I've been trying to combine uh, that that way, because I love the way they go go out of phase. That's another thing which came back into my music, which was excluded. It came back in all music, in fact, uh, repetition. It was forbidden at one point. You couldn't do that. Remember? Yeah. No, you don't remember. You're much well. too young. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remember uh, being very scared at, at the idea that I could do that, and and yet uh, now it's back. Well, of course, there American yeah. repetitive music, so so called. That that music, the music of uh, Philip Glass and Steve Reich, doesn't seem to have had too much of an impact in France. It does have. Oh, it does. Uh, yes, it does. In a more subtle way, shall we say, it, it's not it's not it's not hearable at first. I was going to say at first sight, at first hearing. Yes, uh, so sometimes, sometimes it's it's more discreet. Yeah. But I am, uh, I mean, I'm very interested now in repetitive motives that you find in accompaniment figures, uh, and and how to how to deal with that. Astonados. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we we've done away with that also, and that's something missing. We haven't replaced many things. We did away with, we have not replaced. And we miss them, so that that's that's the way I feel, and and uh, so I've replaced them uh, little by little. I'm doing that. In the piece I've just finished, I was very interested in in some of the accompaniment figures of leader repertoire, which I know pretty well because my mother had started singing, and and I accompanied her very soon in the game, and uh, that was very important in my life. So maybe you could say a few words about what you're working on at the moment. To tell you the truth, I've just finished today a piece uh, which I called a Cycle of Leaders for Instruments. I, I've written several. I feel uh, instruments can sing. You, you spent ten years writing a, a grand opera, ten years of your life on that. Oh my heavens, yes. Uh, I, I, the, first, the first opera I wrote, I, I didn't know I was writing an opera. And so when, when it finally became an opera, I decided I had to learn what an opera was all about. And so I began teaching operas in my analysis class at the conservatory. And that was a big lesson for me and for my students, I hope. And finally, when uh, three or four years elapsed, I decided I was going to test my new knowledge. And so I looked for a subject. At that time, I hadn't really thought about vocal writing uh, as as such. I began thinking about it when I was asked to write a lecture at the Collège Philosophique. It was much later, in the 70s, I guess. It was then that I, that I really thought about the problem, uh, that the fact that the voice is not an instrument like any other. Uh, the voice is, is part of our physical nature. And when you hear a voice, you you hear you hear somebody, and your music when you write a C or a G, whether it's sung by you or by you, is going to is going to be completely different. Mm -hmm. And so, writing for voice is the, is not just adding notes after note. You have to be very economical. And I had the models that I knew that so many young composers don't know. I mean, I, I knew. Uh, I knew Mozart operas for, for one thing, and when I thought of Mozart dealing with the, with the, the registers, I, I I was struck by the fact and Schumann and Schubert uh, of the economy, uh, the, the 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 voice writing of these great composers is so economical. Uh, I mean Mozart deals mostly with, within a fifth. And when he when he goes beyond the fifth, it's like the sky opens. You know, mm -hmm. it, it it's so exciting because the voice brings the bring, brings something more than than just a, an instrument. I made a very interesting experiment in my, in my life when I wrote this quartet with voice. I didn't feel that the voice was going to imitate any instrument. It was going to be itself. It was just going to function like an instrument. And that was not easy either. And so I thought I was writing 
at that time I really thought I was writing what I thought I didn't I thought it existed at the time but I thought it was pure music because I had started you know with the idea of writing a quartet so uh, but then when it was sung by this wonderful woman uh, Madame Esplay I realized that she was giving me Madame Esplay and I hadn't controlled Madame Esplay and at that time you know we thought we, thought we had to control everything so uh, that was a problem. But so, if you're writing a collection of um, of, of, of meter or, or songs that don't necessarily have a dramatic aspect, though, do you, do, is there a latent uh, dramatism in, in the in the voice? It sort of comes through anyway, even though there might not necessarily be a narrative dimension. Yes, to yes, uh, the dramatism uh, as well as the music. That's that's uh, that's uh, the miracle. Uh, the, the good big lesson is, is Schubert. I mean, I, I, I was the first one to study uh, Winterreiser and Dichterlieber at the conservatory uh, in my class. And uh, in fact, I did worse than that. I, I, I brought my class to, to the singing class who had studied that, which was not allowed at the time. Uh, visiting from class to class was just not allowed. So I did it. Uh, and and uh, I was I was uh, very surprised at the reaction of my my students were very they they were discovering this this music yeah of course the singing students knew it but then they had never thought of the aspect I was talking about to my analysis student so this was a very very interesting uh, confrontation and over the years I. I, I I, after writing a Dan Opera de Voyage in which instruments behaved like voices, there, there, were, there were no voices in that piece. It was called Dan Opera de Voyage as a kind of joke because it didn't need singers, it didn't need a scenery, it didn't need a theater. You could travel, you, you could put it in travel uh, in a suitcase. Not really, but 22 instruments. Come on. <laughs> but uh, my model there was Romeo and Juliet by Berlioz in which there is a movement called Romeo at the Tomb of the Capulets, which to me is, is more vocal than uh, the vocal parts of that, of that symphony. It calls it symphony. Yeah. And I, w I was wondering how it worked. And I thought at the time that there were probably melodic lines that had to do with uh, the way we feel. With with our emotions and that we use in speaking also, and so I, I when I lectured on on expression in music, I made an experiment which uh, with a singer uh, taken from uh, the Combattimento di di, di Tancredi Clorinda of Monteverdi. Uh, when when he when he wounds her in the combat, not knowing who she is, having not recognized her. And in order to baptize her, uh, he he uh, he, o he opens her the helmet and recognizes her. He says, "Ah, vide, ah, conosce." Well, uh, so the singer uh, we, we made this experiment. The the, um, the singer first said this coldly, "Ah, vide, ah, conosce." Then more emotionally, "Ah, vide, ah, conosce." Ah, vide! Ah, vide! But then I cannot go any further. I have to sing. Mm -hmm. It becomes ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but the the, the 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 melodic line goes from top to bottom. Ah, vide! Ah, conosce! And and this was very interesting to me. In other words. Just that would not have been enough. It wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have been music, unless, uh, unless it was transformed into music, which what Monteverdi does, by putting a, a bass under there, which creates a dissonance, and the dissonance is first a minor seventh, then it's a major seventh, the second time. So, he has made it into music. He has used the the shape of our motion, I mean the vocal shape of our motion, uh, to transform it into music. So that, I mean, you find that in Schubert, you find that in, in but 
stylized. This is to me a very important notion, the idea of stylizing uh, uh, the shape of our intonation, our emotional intonation. Well, it sounds like you're doing that also in these in these new instrumental pieces. These yes, sort of song, songs without words. I, everybody does it. I'm not the only one who does it. I mean, a, a, any good composer has done that. They have all done that. That's why it moves us, because we we understand what it says. So what's the what's the next project? What's the next piece uh, you're working on? <laughs> wait a minute. Let me rest for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next project. Well, there are lots of projects uh, in, in the air. Uh, they they may be. I shouldn't talk about that because it's it's not really ready. But the next project is actually uh, th pieces I'm going to hear pr premiere. Uh, the two pieces are finished. One one is a kind of cello concerto for cello and string, which is called Side Roads. And uh, by the way, this uh, song cycle is called Woman at Twilight. Uh, that, that's a reference to titles of paintings. I, I like titles of paintings. In fact, uh, the title is in French, Femme le Soir. It sounds better in French. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, painters have wonderful titles for their paintings. Uh, the other piece is um, my quartet number seven with trumpet. Uh, the, the, there was this quartet with a voice. There's another one with clarinet, and this is number seven. There's what, yeah, there's number six with clarinet, number seven with the uh, trumpet uh, for Arkan Hardenberger, and that is going to be done in, in uh, Malmö in, in Sweden in, in October. And you recently wrote a double concerto with him as, as well? I, rec I recently wrote, yes, a, a double concerto which was played three times now, uh, four times now, yes and which has been recorded, uh, which will come out probably in, uh, in the fall. That was one of the things uh, that, that uh, scared me when I was writing the piece for Berlin, because I was writing that piece at the, practically at the same time. And uh, that piece I had thought about f for quite a while, because it's such a complicated idea to write for two instruments as different as that. And, and I started with a very strange idea. Uh, which was that the piano, it was the first idea that came to me, the piano was going to try to behave like a trumpet. And, and the trumpet didn't want to behave like a trumpet, which is a kind of operatic idea. <laughs> uh, easy to say, but not easy to do, as you probably can imagine. Yes. Yeah. So I had, the, I had the piano play uh, fanfares and things, uh, you know, typical trumpet for a while, and the, and the trumpet playing very lyrical lines, not paying attention, you know. Well, uh, I think it worked, but whew, I, I really thought I, I couldn't make it, no. So you mentioned just now that, that uh, these, these new instrumental pieces you're working on were, were allude to or they're inspired by the visual arts. And I, I have to ask you about that, actually, because you've known a lot of very significant artists, and you've been friends with them. And I draw from that that, um, that, uh, that the visual arts has, has had an impact on your approach to music, maybe, over the years. Has, is, is there a connection for you between, between the, the, the sorts of artists that you've known and the work that you've done? Has there been a... For a very long time, I was... I was practically blind to, uh, although although in my childhood at school, uh, not not only my childhood, I was already 12 or 13, uh, I, I loved painting and I did a lot of painting and I painted, uh, I, I thought maybe I could be a painter. I, I, I remember very clearly some, some uh, uh, still lifes I, I painted and I, with, with delight you know the the, the, the yellow of a, of a lemon or trying to trying to to to, to reproduce the, that yellow for for days yeah, I remember that very, as, a, as a joy you know very so I, I was really puzzled then I gave that up and for a while I, I wasn't that interested although I, re I remember discovering Monet at the Orangerie in Paris when I came back that was oh, but I, I remember discovering a painting which was practically abstract at that time. 
to me, it was it was a sort of confirmation that I was in the right. I, I was doing the right thing. And then we met Jean Paul Riopel and uh, Joan Mitchell, and we were very close for for quite a while. Joan loved music. Jean Paul did too, but uh, Joan pretended that he didn't, but he did. He was very he he was very sensitive to 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 certain things. Now, but Joan uh, painted at night uh, with music. And uh, we used to have incredible discussions about her painting. I mean, I, I used to look at her painting and ask her things like, how do you know when your painting is finished? One day I was in New York and I went into a gallery and discovered an immense painting which was called Quatuor Deux by Betsy Jolas. It's a triptych, right? Quadriptych. Quadriptych, yeah. Yes, enormous, six meters. She had never told me. She she had come to to a concert, a point d'eau, uh, viola concerto, and she was fa she was fascinated by the whole thing, and she she sent me a letter which I published in my book, which I love, in which she drew the bass clarinet, and and, and she she asked me in the letter, what is this sexy instrument? <laughs> she 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 was fascinated by the sight of it also. As well as and then, I, I remember I wrote a piece called "Music for Joan." Uh, on the occasion of a, of a big retrospective she had in Buffalo, it started in Buffalo, and then it continued uh, all over the United States. She she liked it. She liked the piece. We we followed each other's work very closely for for quite a while. And I followed uh, Jean-Paul Riopel's uh, work as well, and we owned uh, some some of their work uh, at home, so I could watch them. I used to watch watch these paintings very intently and and try to understand how how they worked. And and in fact, I was interested by an aspect which was never dealt with uh, among musicians, which was texture. Texture, the word, in fact, was not used in French. In, in terms of music or in terms of painting or both? In, in terms of music. The idea of texture did, did, not, did not come in, into, into play. Well, to me, it, it's so important. How do you define texture in music? Well, it, it's, uh, it's, like, it's like material. It, it, it's, the, it's the way things are hung, uh, uh, put together. Uh, and and they, they could be tight or, or loose or with holes or with you know it's absolutely essential and it could be it can be thematic. Uh, to me, it, it was a quite a discovery that uh, this is what I was going to do because uh, I, I, quite frankly, I regretted. I, I, I did I didn't regret it, but I, I felt the, the the absence of anything anything we could remember. Mm -hmm. Was was impossible. It, we could we we had to do something about that, and and so I didn't really dare uh, repeat things openly at the, at that time. I, I'm not uh, that careful today. I I, ha I know how to repeat them so that they're interesting. Yeah, that's another thing we had to learn. Yeah. How how to s stimulate the memory without without just repeating it over and over again. Because in classical music, this rep repetition is compensated by the, by, by the harmony, by the, by the modulation. And it's very strange because to come back to this, uh, this young man I was telling you about who was writing tonal music, Quartet, my criticism, I said, since you're writing tonal music, you should learn to modulate. He wasn't modulating. It was, you know, forgotten what it meant to modulate, and so it became boring. It was always in the same tone, in the same pitch. Well, that's something you see also with the minimalists, though, where they'll they'll stay on, they'll have these um, um, consonant sonorities, but they don't move anywhere. They don't move. They'll stay on the same chord for a well, long time. Well, it's it's so easy not to move, huh? Uh, so much music today does that too. I mean, they, they sit on a pedal or they sit on, on a chord, 
and and just just uh, sweep it around, sweep around the court. Uh, I I don't like to do that. Well, it seems like there's a, there's a problem in the sense that very often you you either have a music that where the harmonic rhythm is extremely fast, it's changing all the time, and there's nothing that really returns. Um, and then on the other side, you have a music that's completely harmonically static, and it, it right. seems like it's. But you've managed to 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 create a, a harmonic style where it's it's mobile and it has a direction to it, but it's but it's it's neither it's it's neither of those extremes somehow. I'm glad you I'm glad you feel it that way because it's hard. It's something I work for, and and it's difficult. It's very difficult. I I don't know why, but I feel that the newness of a pitch when it appears is very important. Mm -hmm. it, it's like a new harmony, you know, and, and, uh, and, and the newness of, of several pitches as, as a chord. For, for a while I was, I was writing mainly counterpedal music which came from my Renaissance training probably. But I've, I've come to write chords now uh, and I've simplified my chords considerably. I used to write uh, you know, like not 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 necessarily twelve bar chords, but <laughs> ten or or nine, and I, I felt very strongly now that that I look at that music, that some of those chords are, become grey. I mean, they 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 don't have any personality. There is not much difference between ten and eleven, or between which Strokhausen understood very well right away. Now, that's right. So. My chords now are much simpler. What prompted this change for me was my writing for the Zart Florissant, in which I... William Christie. Yeah, William Christie, Baroque, Baroque Ensemble. I, I was scared at the beginning. What, what am, how, how am I going to write to, for these people, you know? I said to myself, I cannot master their, their tuning. It's too complicated for me. The only thing I know is fourths and fifths. I know they're going to be okay. So I'm going to work with fourths and fifths, and so my my problem now is uh, is not a problem. Uh, now I I work a lot with fourths and fifths. Uh, I I like to sit a chord on a fourth rather than a fifth. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the way it it it's, it's hangs it doesn't sit it hangs. You know? uh, Debussy does that also. Yeah. And uh, what I do with those chords is is I I spoil them. I try to to make them a little dirty, with dust and and, and uh, you know they, which which is uh, just uh, toads that do not belong to the to to the fifths or fourths, uh, but uh, give it color, give it color. Uh, I do that perhaps a little too much, maybe you know. Uh, we'll, we'll see, but this this is what I do with my harmony these days. Uh, but it's still it's it's still a harmony that moves. So how do you when you're working though? Because you, you mentioned at the beginning that you work almost measure by measure. Yes. So how do you how do you figure out about the the, the, the right speed of the harmonic rhythm and and making sure that it it doesn't change too quickly or too slowly? And good question. Uh, sometimes I don't know how I do it. <laughs> Uh, recently, in in the in the double concerto, I realized that I, at one point I, I I had I really had to write fast, fast music. I wanted things to to go fast. When the trumpet finally decides to play the trumpet, yeah, and so what I did, I I just I just wrote out measures. I I want that many measures. I decided I wouldn't change measures, so I knew how about how, how what the speed would be, and I would I would I I got a metronome mark. And and I and I filled it out. I just stupidly filled it out, and in that case, the harmony moves uh, moves slower uh, because uh, things go for so fast. Yeah, yeah. So that that was that was a problem because in fact that that has been one of my problems, and in fact I, I think it's a problem with a great many. Young composers, they don't even know that they have that problem. Writing fast music. A lot of composers think they're writing fast music just because the tempo is fast, but it isn't. And uh, I found out my, my, my goal, shall we say, is to be able to write something like the Queen Mab Scherzo, you know? To me, it's, it's uh, or, or the Midsummer Night's Dream Overture. 
I mean, th this is wonderful, fast, light music. And I've, I've now done it several times. Taking a distance from the act of writing, which takes time, because you can't write as fast as you think. And I was very impressed when I looked at Beethoven's sketches. In one of the sketches for uh, Piano Sonora, uh, they're just empty measures. And then suddenly there's a G flat. The, the, the piece is in E flat. And suddenly there's a G flat. And then measures, empty measures, empty measures. Then suddenly there's a G, there's an F sharp. In other words, he's already thinking of the harmony. He's thinking of the large scale uh, harmonic plan of the piece. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, that's another that's another difficulty that you ex that you encounter with contemporary music, though, is that often it's as though it's neither fast nor slow. It's kind of it, you don't I, I don't know. It's kind of nothing. It's not fast or slow. It's 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 kind of consistent in the in its rate of uh, of evolution over time, and it, it's it is very rare actually that you see uh, composers writing music that is fast and exciting or slow and meditative and, and that yeah. you have these different uh, what would you call them uh, agogic um, um, qualities it jumps you think it's going to be fast and, and it doesn't it doesn't last it's it's very jumpy I, I don't know if mine is jumpy maybe it isn't uh, it, it's getting less it, it's getting less I I, I try uh, I, my, my, my tendency w is, is to cut off too soon. And, and uh, the, another tendency I have to fight against is to cut off the, the, the duration of a sound. Uh, I find that in performance, performers have a tendency to cut off too soon. I have to fight against that. And I have to show them the, the duration of the, the of the note and and oh yes of course yes they've been taught I mean the, the minute they see a rest after a, say a quarter note they they cut off the quarter note too soon mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you've noticed that yes yeah yeah mm -hmm. and that's that's dramatic and it's very important for me sometimes uh, for, for the end of something overlapping. And if, if you cut it off too soon, it doesn't overlap, you know? Well, I that's like one it. of the great lessons of Bach also, is how he yes. always keeps everything moving all the time. That's so right. It's always leading that's somewhere. Right. Another thing, uh, I, I remember my, my, my chorus teacher, uh, the chorus uh, director, who was very strict about the, the exact duration, especially in Renaissance music, you have, because otherwise the harmony gets troubled. Uh, so... But, but it has to be exact. But if, it, if it's too short, you don't get the feeling of the chord. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The same thing is, is true of rhythm for, with rhythm sometimes, yes. Yeah. Well, one thing that I think is absolutely wonderful is when you find performers who are willing to play contemporary music as though it were classical music and who are able to play it with the same degree of investment and because it's, it's never very satisfying when you just have a, a premiere and they, they rehearse it two or three times and then they do the piece and then that's it. It's, it's much more interesting to find performers, as you've been very lucky to have over the course of your career, performers who are willing to take the time to uh, learn the pieces properly and, and play them repeatedly and defend them. Oh, yeah. That, that has happened to me a few times uh, over the years now. I mean, I'm old enough to have known this, uh, which is great. My quartet was played many, many times. And it was so well played already at the first time so that, that over the years uh, it became uh, quite nearly a classic. So there, there's a tradition now. And, and it was recorded very soon after it was premiered so that people can, who want to play it again can, can refer to that recording. It, it, it's an absolute reference. It's an amazing recording. I have to also say, for yes. anybody who's watching this video who doesn't know your Quatuor Deux, that they should hear it because it's 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 an amazing piece. It's a very important piece in in your development also, yeah. and and there's a, a amazing recording by Madi Mespré, which is a which is a classic. Well, not only by Madi Mespré, but by every, every everyone else. The Trio Accord Français is wonderful. Everybody is wonderful. I must say that the preparation of this recording and especially the premiere uh, was nearly dramatic because uh, they, the performers told me afterwards that they 
they had decided not to do it. <laughs> it was so difficult. I think they must have had 30 rehearsals. 30 rehearsals? Uh, yes. Uh, well, this was 1966. And if you hear the piece, uh, maybe you can realize uh, the difficulty. Uh, actually, the notation doesn't help because uh, it, it's a notation in which the, the performers sort of relate to each other all the time. But they're, roos they're loosely related, though. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. And uh, I've often thought maybe I could write it differently, but I don't think I can. I don't, I don't see how I could, I could write it differently. Uh, I mean, the result was exactly what I wanted. Uh, but I had to have this incredible faith that, that they all did, especially Serge Collot, uh, who convinced the others to, to go ahead and do it. <laughs> and and uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't allowed during, during the, the 30 rehearsals. Uh, I was only allowed at the very end. If you like this channel, support it. Your help allows me to keep on making high-quality music education videos available to anyone around the world who wants to watch them at any time for free. Check out the rewards for varying levels of support at www.patreon.com/samuelandreev. Thanks for watching.